welcome to Sundays with Jane Eyre. This is the final episode, episode 28, Reader, I Married Him, covering the last chapter, volume three, chapter 12, or chapter 38 of Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach in Philadelphia, and joining me today as co-hosts are the Ghoul Guides, our friends, Dr. Lauren Nixon and Mary Going. Hello. Hello, it's nice to be here for the for the last one. Yes, <laughs> so quickly. It did so, um, uh, and uh, yeah, and here we go. <laughs> so, I, like doing this, like ending two other, like the Dracula of the Long Run, and then Frankenstein, and then this one. This is still the hardest episode to do. I'm like sheer nervous the whole like you know lead up to it, and like oh, I hope it goes right. So let's let's just hope. Again. But <laughs> and, but and thankfully, I have you guys here. So um, who have been with us for so many of these. So thank you. Um, welcome back, everyone, uh, for the uh, end of another great run. Um, many of you have actually uh, many of in the audience have actually um, uh, been with us for all of those shows. So, you know, that's that's really great to know, too. Um, I wanted to mention I wanted to call out to something I haven't called out in a while is Tucker's music at the start of the show. Tucker Christine, everyone who is a Dracula collector. He was one of the co-hosts of Sundays with Dracula is also a fine musician who records his pleated gazelle. Uh, if you tune in very early on Zoom before the opening credits, there's the with we have a slideshow and the tune there is called Decay's Effacing Fingers, which which uh Tucker composed during the Dracula run. The the quote is from is from Dracula, but it's actually Stoker quoting Byron from from his poem The uh the the Jower. Um and uh and then the opening credits song that plays over our opening credits is called No Bird No Net. Uh, and then the closing credits, is, the the tune is called Secrets. So it has been a great pleasure working with Tucker, who has created music for all of our shows. I think Tucker's in the audience today, too. So um, thank you, Tucker, for creating such great music for all of the programs that I've gotten to do here. Yes, he is. Good. So you can all, if you're watching on Zoom and, and, and in the chat, thank Tucker. He's there. So um. I have a cocktail this week, too. I'm drinking a, a champagne cocktail, of course, and I actually just uh, drank most of it just waiting. So I'm just going to I'm going to freshen it up a little. It is uh, I got a little pear cider. And a little Amaro. And then the champagne. Oh, good. Still nice and fresh. Get a little bubbly going. And there we go. So cheers. I'm calling this drink best on earth. <laughs> I was very tempted to go with something with Adele because, you know, it is, and it's French champagne I'm using, um, like Adele's French defects or something like that. But, you know, I, I just thought that that joke wouldn't last. So I'm just calling it best on earth. Guys drinking tea today, I imagine, or just water? I am actually just drinking water today. How incredibly boring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also just have hot water. So, yeah, also quite boring. <laughs> there you go. Your, your, your drink is way more fancy than ours. I, yes. <laughs> it sounds way more delicious. <laughs> happy to drink for the three of us. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, we didn't do cocktails for every episode of this run, but I decided I was doing, I did them for the last three. So we did two for the last two shows and the audience mm -hmm. named them and that was a lot of fun and i thought i could not have one for the final show so um um we there's so much i want to talk well we're, we're going to talk about the last chapter today obviously and it's short which is really nice and, and it's, it's a lot of wrap up itself so what's really wonderful is then we will get to wrap up the whole book and i, and I want to hear you know your guys thoughts on a lot um the last chapter, well, before, I, yeah, the last chapter, when it ended, um, she had, um, uh, she's already like dumb Sinjin, like she hears the voice and she's like, get it. She literally tells him something like leave or something like that. And Sinjin has to like walk off with his tail between his legs and she rushes back 
to Thornfield. It's in a ruin. And then she has the big reunion with Rochester. And that's the first thing I want to hit. Yeah, I, w- I want to ask you guys for is about Jane's reunion with Rochester. And um, what do you guys think? Because it's such a different read now later in, you know, as as we as we get older and read this that rochester's not the perfect you know romantic lead clearly um uh and i want to know what you guys think of jane's reunion with rochester and kind of the bigger the broader question is because i i i I think i think bronte is i think she makes a clear effort to redeem him um and i and i and i want to know your thoughts on that I think I think there's always going to be two parallel ways to read both Sinjin, the character of Sinjin, but also the, the reunion and, and the redemption arc of, of Rochester. I think we can look at it as, you know, in, in the contemporary period and, and how um how Bronte wanted it to be um to be received. But I also think we can bring our own contemporary understandings and, and kind of viewpoints to it and understand that those kinds of positions are in parallel and maybe not in agreement with each other but that they can coexist to a certain extent. So for Bronte, Rochester needs to be redeemed. He is the kind of imperfect sinner. Um, And we can get to this a little bit more in in this final chapter as well. But the idea that his redemption arc is very much in that kind of Christian sinner. Um, Everyone is able to be forgiven and and deserves, you know, to be forgiven. And, And that's kind of where she's, I think she's coming from. At the same time, I think we can look at it and think this is a little bit problematic. And, and I think especially with the, the, the way that um, the way that Rochester is punished um, as part of that redemption arc um, with particularly with his blindness, um, because I think that it is problematic to have to use you know, disabilities as punishments and then also potentially rewards um, and, and to see that disabilities in that kind of framing as you know punishments for transgressions um, Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing but I think we can look look at these characters and and this redemption arc in parallel with those with those two kind of perspectives um Lauren I I don't know I don't know if you have any thoughts about that um yeah I mean it is a difficult it's a difficult kind of balance reading it as a modern reader um And I think this is one of those moments where we have to be so conscious of the way that this text, like Wuthering Heights, gets romanticised. We we often are sold Jane Eyre as a romance. And what's really interesting is, for me, is that Bronte doesn't, she's not unromanticizing. she's not trying to take the romance out of it, but what she's trying to do, to me, is do something kind of a bit different. And this is where, you know, Um, I think you get right it's like Wilkie Collins doing this as well there's a lot of this in the 19th century of sort of like you must be humbled you must kind of like be brought down that there's this kind of and I see this very much as the kind of rise of the middle class rise of the kind of like individual that you have to kind of have everything taken away from you to be your like truest self and there's this idea that Rochester the hardship that he's known isn't hardship enough almost or isn't a hardship that can could, that can justify his actions you know and and obviously this is what writers like Jean Reese pick up on in White Talk SOC you know how much of his hardship is of his own making how much is is actually genuine and the way that he's kind of brought down and stripped back is what and, and we get this in a moment at the beginning of this chapter with the way that they're, they're wed, the way that the wedding is received, you know, it, it's this very kind of simple, like, you know, romance, simple love. It's, it's without adornment. It's without, you know, it's all laid bare. It's not about purity or sanctity or, or being coming to the altar completely fresh and pure, but coming to the altar to be bound in matrimony in a way where you both are, are aware of one another's sins, you're aware of what's come before, and you are on the same level and you're going to go forwards together. Mm-hmm. So in some ways that's wildly romantic, you know, we don't get that a lot in novels, particularly not at this point in time. And we can certainly see that as this kind of like aspiration that you can, 
you can be wed in a way where you know you're on the same level and you you can put everything aside and you have this real marriage of equals but like Mary said you know that using disability as an equalizer is really problematic yeah. there's yeah. still this imbalance they're still living in this broader society so it's a really interesting one and I do think what's fascinating as I said before with other texts I like to look at the contemporary responses as in our contemporary responses What's fascinating to me about Jane Eyre is what we perceive as a modern society about where the romance lies, because I think that what we think of as being the romance of a novel like Jane Eyre is very, very different from the actual romance that it's portraying, um, mm-hmm. which is just really fascinating that maybe that that hasn't translated across the ages in the same way because we yeah. don't have the same society. And you, and you especially see that in adaptations where yeah. like all those small changes they make to make it a more palatable kind of, you know, relationship between the two of them mm-hmm. and um, smooth down some of the edges of Rochester. Um, yeah. uh, but also that, that, you know, Rochester's, you know, conditions at the end and how he's lost the house and, um, uh, and, and the things that he's gone through also acts as a kind of, you know, uh, a, a class leveling in that when he meets, he's kind of in a position at the end where Jane needs to help him. And that's something. So that, so that winds up changing this from the usual. So many romances are, 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 are like Cinderella stories, you know, where, where she is elevated to a status. And in this when at the end, it's it's more it's more he's lowered than she's elevated um uh, and, and i find that fascinating about this which is also interesting because it's going back to that thing again it's one of the gothic tropes that we don't always pick up on that bronte's using it's really popular in the gothic to have the heroine as the as the kind of like um the noble peasant is what you call it where there's a character who appears to be a, a penniless orphan and it turns out that they're, they're the heir to whatever um and Jane being revealed as an heiress at the end is is very much in keeping with yeah. this gothic trope but often in in particularly like the Radcliffian uh gothic you know Adeline in Romance in the Forest probably the most romantic of those novels is revealed to be a very rich mm-hmm. like noble lady who gets the king's favor her love interest is also from a noble family but actually it turns out she's way wealthier than he is um it happens udolfo valencourt's the second son emily is the heiress you know so it's actually like interesting because we've we've had a tradition of novels where the girl the, the female is the one who actually is revealed to be the one of of status the one of of you know like wealth but it does it slightly different here because it's acknowledged that there's that discrepancy um, and it's acknowledged that kind of he was much more kind of like conscious of his status beforehand and used his status beforehand as a kind of way to to trap her you know that's where the, the I am no bird line comes from so it is really mm-hmm. interesting the way that she she is still at this point taking a trope and and changing it slightly. Good. All right. Anything else on the lead up to this chapter? Sinjin, we're glad. Well, no, I was going to say, are we glad Sinjin's gone? Then we're going to get hit with all Sinjin at the end of the chapter. Not, like, what? <laughs> what? You're haunting me. So, um, yeah. So there we go. Um, Sinjin's a really great example of that. What I said, that parallel reading where, where yeah. I think it's especially we need to we need to have that kind of what would this have mean what would this have meant in in Bronte's period and, and what what do what do we think it means now uh, but we'll get we'll get to those final paragraphs in a minute but I think it, it is a kind of um a reflection of what Bronte is doing with Rochester and Jane anyway they're kind of two sides of the same coin um, but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get to that, and we can talk about how it's meant to be a good thing in the book. But actually, our contemporary readings, I think we should be a, a, a lot more critical about those last few paragraphs because I, I think yeah, they are they are um, not not that great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll hit them. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, this uh, final chapter begins one of the most famous lines now in literature, reader, I married him. Um, and uh, I, I love how it is 
we are the readers we are brought back into the story you know right before it ends as, as she has done for the entire novel to address the reader directly um is I, I, is that is that a convention? Do you think that carries over from from 18th century novels, in which the when in which the narrator was so kind of present, almost as a character? In this case, I think it's wonderful because I think it always kinds of uh, kind of enables us, it kind of brings us into participating in the story in some sense. What do you think? It's a about bit, the, one of the most famous lines no, yeah right it's a, so this is a bit of a tricky one and I think this is one that could be very much open in, to interpretation depending on how you read the history of the novel and how you kind of perceive the change because one Bronte is actively embodying a previous trend she is, sets this novel in the past and obviously yes Jane gets older as it goes on but she's consciously calling back to the gothic of the 18th century but also life writing novels like um Tristan Shandy uh like Robinson Crusoe and those so the first half of the 18th century we have a very conscious author to reader relationship that is problematized because the author is always lying um unconsciously lying you know Defoe presents Robinson Crusoe as a true story so in the first half of the 18th century we got a lot of epistolary texts that were written as if they were real um and the way that the writer would would talk to the reader was that kind of thing like well are they talking to a relative are they talking you know is it a relationship between writer and reader that then falls out of fashion and we start to get the historical style novel, we get the third person novel. We don't have a lot of conscious interaction, but then what we do have every now and then is the authorial voice, which is not always done in a kind of, um, like in a, in a kind of direct way. Then we get the kind of Austin, you know, the famous Austin free and direct mm -hmm. speech. And then we get this with Bronte. So, what she's doing here it's kind of to take it right back to the first episode in some ways it's really radical and revolutionary because she's reviving something but it's also already been done to such an extent so it's yeah. like and dickens still doing really, it dickens is dickens yeah, is a very can, present narrator yeah you can really read this and i think in a couple of different ways because you know in a lot of ways this is a very conventional text and doing this this reader you can imagine reader you must understand is very conventional but then for Bronte to be doing it in the first person from a woman's voice not a male narrator not a woman who's writing an epistolary but an actual kind of like active female narrator is actually quite revolutionary so you have this really strange tense kind of almost conflicting narrative within the first person narrative in this reader connection itself um, and I do think it's one that's really open to interpretation. You know, some people thought this novel was Jacobin and needed to be banned and it was dangerous. But we read it now and we're like, it's very conventional in a lot of ways and problematic. And I think that reader, reader eye element is, is part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd be interested to see what everybody else thinks and how everybody yeah. else feels about it. Um. There's also the just the, the expression itself in that in that we in this novel it's I married him. Um, oh, you want to talk about that? I can tell. <laughs> is that empowering? I mean, yes, it's, it's, it, yes. it never it never happens. Like this yeah. is such a like I married him. Women up until this point are always the secondary inactive participant in any matrimony. It's always they were wed, we were wed, like not I married him because the woman in particularly in the late 18th century you know there's a marriage contract and that contract is very specific there's ownership elements to it um you could not give yourself away you could not give your own permission if you wanted you know if you were going to give your own permission in marriage you had to flee and elope you know you had to be married at Gretna Green or abroad so for her to say I married him is this kind of wild rebellious revolutionary thing to say 
it seems so simple but again go back to what I was just saying about like the romance of this portion just that statement I married him is is so powerful because there's so much complicit there particularly when we think about their status their wealth you know acknowledging that yeah she's actually now in a much more powerful position than he is and yeah just saying like I married him not we were married or you know Mm -hmm the priest married us you know it's, there's usually someone else we be it the, pe- the priest the man or the father or the guardian there's usually another active participant in a in a wedding yeah. that is not a woman <laughs> and technically she's not even age of consent um and which is which is certainly 21 in in the 19th century and you know i wonder like there's like a weird like other thing going like sinjin could actually wind up being the one who's supposed to give consent and because he may be her oldest yeah. male relative technically yeah. sinjin has to give permission for jane to marry because she has no other adult male relative who is of age um now there is elements of we don't know the full extent of her trust and her wealth and what mm-hmm. the uh, legality of that is and whether or not that was you know her straight way whether or not it says at 21 we know she's already got certain elements of it um often that would have an element but yeah she's technically also being a little bit rebellious because she should ask for permission yeah. there isn't technically no one to give that permission yeah. Um, I mean, she's taking control well. of the, she's taking control of that inheritance too. Like she calls mm-hmm. the lawyers and says this needs to be divided this way. And so yeah. we talked about that before, where she almost becomes like the the patriarchal figure, the person in power of this family now. Yeah, is what she kind of the position. She and interestingly, in. after you know, to to skip ahead a little bit, and there's still probably things to talk about. But after she's come back and told John and Mary, the first people she mentions are her female cousins Mm -hmm. and I think that's really telling as well in terms of her embodying this this position as the head of the family um you know she she says yeah I am going to write small house in Cambridge but the first people she mentions by name is Diana and Mary and you know it's kind of like the the other two people in this family the people I'm interested in are my two female cousins and they're the two who are going to kind of like, oh yeah, the one's going to come to me after the honeymoon and things like that. So it's, again, it's really kind of flips the the marriage plot on its head. Yeah. Um, so to speak. And this, and this, her, and her taking the, taking the lead here, being the one that, you know, it's I married him. I mean, this is what this novel has been leading up to. I mean, at every moment of a, a like a potential union, with Rochester first, she demands it to be on equal status and will not say yes until she believes it is. She doesn't know he's been lying about he's already married, mm-hmm. but that's her demand. And then she leaves again. So she says, no, I, I won't participate in another relationship with you as a mistress because that wouldn't be an equal relationship. And then with Sinjin, she wants that equality of heart that she had, that she felt she had with Rochester. And when he can't give her that, well, he almost, you know, she almost succumbs to him, to his, to his, uh, you know, brutal kind of, you know, uh, his, 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 his uh, soothing brutality is what it is, you know, that she kind of talks about, um, but she doesn't. And, uh, and now again, it's, you know, when she does marry, it is her making the choice to marry and on her terms. So um we had a question here unless it sits right here um is it un lynn asks is it unradical that jane cared for rochester more than god um does it say does it say that exactly here is that in the previous chapter um back in the day weren't women supposed to worship their husbands and the men were to worship god because women were spiritually limited mary you want to take some of that yeah, so I think I think we hit a lot of these points in in this chapter actually. That that whole idea of um, what does equality mean in in a marriage, but also Bronte's views of um, you know humanity's relationship with God, um, and it's often framed in in those kind of gendered ways. Um, the relationship between um, God's chosen people 
and God is is termed it in the language of marriage. Um, Israel is the bride of God, um, and that then um, and also in terms of you know master God is the master. Humans are the the um, the, the people who serve God. So so those kinds of um, hierarchical relationships um, are kind of transplanted onto human relationships or perhaps the other way around, whereas those hierarchical relationships are then transplanted onto our understandings of God. But the idea that men are the kind of the head, um, the he- um, and that women, while they're equal, their roles are different. Um, and we'll get, you know, we'll get to this in the kind of the, the ways um, that Jane and, and Rochester, their, their kind of relationship and, and their marriage um, and the way that they care for each other. But yeah, the idea that ultimately, there is a kind of equality, but that it's also based on a hierarchy um, where men are are in in the lead. And I don't necessarily think that it, it's that um, Bronte is suggesting that um, Jane loves Rochester more than God, but that Jane's love for God comes through in her love for Rochester, um, and the idea that together their marriage is a way of also reflecting, um, you know. Jane's especially but also the the kind of societal relationship with God and, and honoring that um which is why her marriage before she she you know um obviously she couldn't have gotten married but she didn't want to be his mistress because that would have um you know almost been an insult it would have been sacrilegious to God but now now that Rochester has been humbled and she can get married on her own terms their terms in that kind of equality, but that equality that does come with some caveats. Um, and again, I think we have to have that kind of parallel um, viewing where you, you think about this in, in, in its period. Um, and we can also look in, and think about it now. Do we think that, you know, how do we view this kind of relationship and this kind of marriage from our contemporary period? Probably a little bit different, but in the context of the novel, it's, it's, almost perfect it's what you know it's what you'd want two people coming together with mutual love um but also humbled in the eyes of god um and, and that's specifically one of the ways that that bronte has has humbled her character rochester that he has gone moved from this irreligious dog to mm-hmm. last chapter when he was so praising god and on his knees at one point you know saying how humbled and, and how grateful to god that he was and which seems to be a very important thing for Jane that she needs him to also be, or at least not be an ir- irreligious talk. <laughs> exactly. She could have had a relationship for love. She could have been his mistress, but that wasn't enough. And she could have had a marriage with Sinjin, but that would have been loveless. And that also wasn't enough. What, what we have in this kind of this, this third successful marriage is both um, where you have the, the, the mutual love and care and companionship, but also the love and respect of of God. Um, so here it is a kind of joining of those two things um, in, in that in that way. Yeah, especially because Jane's relationship with God is so closely tied to her individuality. One of the things that this text is doing is picking up on, and this is one of the reasons it was called Jacobin and it was called, you know, a, a dangerous book because is we're moving away from at this point the very personal one-on-one relationship with God that we had in the late 18th century towards a more again a more structured relationship with God that is hierarchical that is based around charity and church and and teachings um and you know there's a lot of prophets and there's a lot of you know offshoots of the church this is where we get a lot of you know these kind of radical sects come from and and what Jane is kind of saying essentially throughout this text is my relationship with God and my faith in God is part and parcel with my independence and individuality as a person so my you know it's not so much about pious you know she's not Pamela it's not about piousness it's not about how often do we go to church? It's not about how often do we pray? It's not about the 10 commandments. It's not about Jesus. It's about Jane Eyre, the individual Mm -hmm. and her individual understanding and relationship with God and with faith and what that means in a marriage. And like Mary just said, like in marriage one, it goes against it in marriage two, it goes against it in a completely different way. 
the third time we finally get this kind of like, ah, yes, we embrace each other as individuals and that individual relationship with God. And that I think is, is where the sort of like the danger comes from in this text, particularly because not just because it's, it's quite a radical idea in terms of faith, although it's kind of not because it's, it's just a bit maybe outdated or it's challenging this current status quo, but because she is a woman Mm -hmm. um, and because her version of faith leads her to what we see and what other characters see as being rebellion. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, let's get to the second sentence of the chapter, which is, (laughs) which is a quiet (laughs) wedding. We had he and I, the parson and clerk were alone present. Oh, but you know, the first wedding was actually a quiet one. It was just you. And then the lawyer comes in, but I also have this, I also imagine that her Rochester are there and the clergyman says, because it's part of the service. He says, if there are any impediments to this union. And I could just imagine Jane like looking around, <laughs> like making sure <laughs> this time no one else is there to interrupt the proceedings. Um, yeah, just, and he just can't say or do it. So a, she, could, she doesn't yeah. have to be rude. So he can't say or do it. So, you know. Yeah, um, just checking he doesn't have any other wives or. Yeah. <laughs> no more ethics so, <laughs> yeah um but uh they get married they just it's just the two of them and 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 they come back and then and then you'd mentioned this before when they come back to the to the the, the housekeeper and her and her husband john uh mary and john um and mary just doesn't even react she says you know um she just keeps on you know we're oh, oh and it's also the, the this really strange thing about how Sir, she's she she is so thankful that um they are not the kind of servants who you know um uh who take a piece of news without encouraging the danger of having one's ears pierced by some shrill ejaculation and subsequently stunned by a torrent of wordy wonderment so <laughs> she's not um, in a net <laughs> yeah so um the uh and then uh and and um because Mary's reaction is, have you, she says they're married. Have you miss? Well, for sure. And that's it. So no, you know, which is the most Yorkshire thing. As well. <laughs> like, there you go. I can literally hear, like I can hear it perfectly. Oh, have you? Oh, that's nice. Love. Um, John's a little more effusive. Uh, I tell Mary how it would be. Um, uh, and he says something nice here. I knew what Mr. Edward would do, and I was certain he would not wait long neither. And he's done right, for all I know. Um, I wish you joy, miss. Um, she gives him five pounds because you have to, you know, what's I mean, you're supposed to, you know, give your servants um, uh, a little gratuity um, and uh, on, on, on all special occasions. And, um, uh, and then John says, or, or is it, she says, I caught the words and I'm assuming it's John. And I, I think it is, but I, I don't, I'm, but it could be Mary, but I think it's, John. it would be interesting. It would be more interesting if it was Mary, but it must, but it's probably John and that she'll happen to do better for him, nor any of the grand ladies. If she beant one of the handsomest, she's no, I can't, I mean, I can't do the, the dialect. She's known fail and very good natured. And uh, in and in his iron, she's a fair, beautiful. Anybody may see that. So we get another reference to Jane being the plain, not beautiful one. Uh, her lack of beauty, um, and um, uh, I, I I like that at the end of this because you know so many so many you know you know stories like this with with the romantic you know, plot are, especially for women, they're all about that kind of transformation, the, 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 the caterpillar to the butterfly. And, and I feel like Bronte constantly, well, I ask you this, it seems to me that Bronte, Bronte constantly argues against that, this whole novel, like that, that that's not important. And here we get another reminder at the end that Jane still looks as she looks, except, you know, in his perception, that's the only thing that has changed is that only because he loves her, she looks beautiful, but she still just has plain look. She, she's never going to look like, you know, Blanche. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, though, like the way that 
there is a subtle difference between the way that Jane describes herself and other people describe Jane because you know what he's saying essentially is like yeah she's not the handsomest handsome is also a very specific term um we when you use handsome for a woman you're talking about a very specific set of features and a very specific silhouette so handsome when particularly at this point in time when you're talking about a woman is about being striking handsome usually you have to be tall you have to have very defined features um to be about class yeah it's usually a very it's very refined and that's why it becomes later as we go through the, the period handsome becomes only used for men because it's about a sort of regality and nobility in one's countenance uh blanche is handsome but um you know a lot of the kind of gothic heroines are pretty um or you know have a soft sweet countenance because Mm -hmm. they're you know they're more of a kind of burky and beautiful handsome is a very um it's a very specific term so the fact that he says he doesn't say she's not pretty he says she's not the handsomest oh interesting yeah he's saying is she's not the most striking she's not the most memorable she's not the most breathtaking but she's not she's she's non-foul like she's not she's not bad looking is what he's saying like she's not ugly she's not unattractive Mm -hmm. um and she's good natured essentially what he's saying here is she's just normal she is a normal woman. She just looks normal. Like mm-hmm. she wouldn't necessarily stand, her face wouldn't stand out in your memory. You wouldn't gasp at the side of the street. Jane describes herself as, as very plain, very nothingy. But what everybody else's perception of her is essentially saying is this is a this is a normal woman. And there's a, I would say, a really strong argument that this novel is is where the Mary Sue comes from. Because Jane could be anybody like her features are so universal say that she could be anybody and I think this is the 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 thing about Jane I don't know if it's so much there is definitely something of Bronte arguing against this this Burkean beauty this idea that women must become beautiful must be beautiful must you know catalyze as beautiful she's definitely rejecting that But I think there's also this element of see yourself in her because she is not this, you know, almost supernaturally beautiful heroine. She's just a normal person. She is a normal woman. There's nothing special about her appearance. And I do think that particularly because when we think about how many Mary Sue texts reference Jane Eyre as a text like this is the beginning of that idea of inviting women to connect with women self-consciously on the top of a novel this isn't like the gothic's almost didactic we are the guide the gothic heroine guides the normal middle class girl reading her book in Hampshire through life this is you might be Jane Eyre Jane Eyre might be someone that you know like she is no different to you she is no you know, special being because she is very normal. And I think that's the thing that is is really fascinating about this because, you know, if Twilight, Twilight is a, is a Mary Sue text. It's a massive self-insert text. One of the novels that is mentioned in that novel is Jane Eyre. It's very much a text that invites the reader, particularly the young female reader, to connect with it on that very deep personal level. And I think when we see that difference between how Jane is described and how Jane perceives herself, that's where we get that very interesting, very kind of subtle interplay between women's worth, women's place in the world, women's connection with other women and beauty um, and, and kind of value and things like that. That's my that's my theory anyway. <laughs> oh, good. Mary, anything on? Oh no, I I agree. Yeah, I th- I, I I think it's also interesting the way that it it it's not the same, but it is almost kind of mirrored with Rochester. You know, he's not he's specifically not described as handsome. Um, and well, and yeah, ugly, it's just, according to Jane. Well, I mean, over and over again, yeah. she's talking about how ugly he is. <laughs> 
yeah but these are just two two people there's nothing really that special to look about them uh as, as opposed to say someone like Sinjin um who is very kind of statuesque in his in his beauty um yeah but yeah I, th- I think it's like yeah look the, these are just two normal or you know ugly plain people but you know look look at them they can be happy together um mm-hmm. I think that's yeah well next Jane gives us the kind of <coughs> um update on all the other characters you know we get this rundown here of what's happened to everyone and and the first one she's mentioned as as you said are diana and mary her cousins um who who approved the step unreservedly her marriage meaning um uh they're very happy about this happening um and just before we get to sinjin um rochester has this beautiful line here our honeymoon um, but at dancing like Diana and Mary, so they'll get they'll come as, as soon as the honeymoon's over. And Roger's just like, Well, they better <laughs> not wait because our honeymoon will shine our life long, its beams will only fade over your grave or mine. Um, that's a nice line. Um, but <laughs> but I have a but for it with Rochester, in that you know, given his you know, his life and, and his, you know, kind of impetuous, you know, uh, emotions, how, you know, I, I just, I have to, you know, question whether or not he can, he can maintain that kind of level, but, but Jane seems to want that. I mean, this is her recounting the story at the end. This might be like, this is always one of those things where I need, I need to do more research into this because I can't say this for sure, but one of the things that I've always wondered about this is that the phrase honeymoon period in terms of pop culture generally comes from the fact that even up until 50, 60 years ago, a lot of couples were marrying without really knowing each other. Mm-hmm. Um, the honeymoon period was often the good period because you'd met on a short courtship. You started living together in most of these cases, the first time you were able to have marital relations. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the first few weeks are usually, you know, bliss and happiness because it's the first time you can be intimate. It's the first time you're away from your parents, particularly if you're a woman. thing. I think, you know, it comes from this longstanding tradition of it was usually only after the honeymoon that you realized that your partner had all of these elements of themselves that you didn't know you could live with and I think there's an argument to be made here that what Rochester is actually saying is we're not going to have that we know each other we have been through the like the worst has already happened like we have been so laid bare to one another you we cannot be more vulnerable than this he's not saying our life is going to be perfect we're never going to have any problems what he's saying I think you could suggest is we actually are going to be happier than everybody else because the the honeymoon period will always be the honeymoon period because we're not going to have that violent come down to earth when Mm -hmm. we realize that we can't live together because we don't we're not compatible or we have these habits you know usually the honeymoon period was oh by the way I'm in debt or yeah I cheated on you loads or I you know I'm a tyrant in the household they've already had that they yeah, none that, of that's like, gonna right happen. after that attempted first marriage yeah none of that's gonna happen to them they've already had it and I think for me this is Bronte poking at the short engagements she's already done this earlier on with Blanche potentially marrying Rochester she's already done this a little bit with Sinjin there's definitely a strong line in this text about resisting the the six weeks engagement mm-hmm. you know like if you guys have been watching Bridgerton you know this is a thing people would would meet at the beginning of the ton at the beginning of the season be engaged and be married by the end of it and that was completely expected because you were going to go back to your country home and the idea was you went back with your wife you went back married this novel massively rejects that she's still very young Mm -hmm. but she's known him not only for quite some time now she knows him in, in the ways that, you know, only a husband and wife can know each other before they're even married. Yeah. And I think I yeah. think that's what this line 
I'd have to do a bit more to kind of <laughs> argue for certain that that's where the honeymoon period like concept and, and kind of line comes from. But that to me, I think is because you get it a little bit in, in like Austin and Bernie where it's like, oh, they married because they fancied each other and now they hate each other and everything's terrible. Mm-hmm. The, that's already a concept at this point in time. And I think that's what he's getting at is that, well, you've already seen me at my absolute worst. So yeah. <laughs> we'll be fine. And speaking of absolute worst, now here we come with a little bit about Sinjin. <laughs> Um, uh, and I love how Sinjin tries to ghost her. How Sinjin received the news, I don't know. He never answered the letter, <laughs> which I communicate. Like six months goes by. Sinjin is so furious that he can't write. But then he writes without, however, mentioning Mr. Rochester's name or alluding to my marriage. His letter was then calm and though very serious kind. He has maintained a regular, though not frequent correspondence ever since. He hopes I am happy and trusts I am not one of those who live without God in the world and only mind earthly things, which is what he thinks that she's doing. Um, that's his, that's the giveaway there that that's what he believes that she is doing, that she has chosen the earthly world over the spiritual one that he offered her. And he's not that wrong. <laughs> right. I mean, isn't, I mean, that's what Jane is choosing when she rejects him for rochester isn't it i think what she's choosing is is that is that you can still have spiritual nourishment from the earthly realm um okay. that, yeah. you know otherwise otherwise what would be the point of earth and and, and everything right you, you know where where here and i think you know going back to what we've said about um bronte and and, and jane's kind of uh, you know religious philosophy the idea that you know, she disagreed with Helen, for example, but she still accepted and still said this is this is something that somebody believes in it and it is right for them and what I'm doing is right for me. And it's I think for Jane, it, that's how she sees it. What Sinjin is doing is great and it's spiritually great and he's spiritually nourished and fulfilled through that way. But Jane is also spiritually fulfilled just through a different way. Um, and I think that's what we're meant to get mm-hmm. from from what Jane is 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 doing with this marriage and and what she is getting out of it, the idea that it's not, you know, it's not the first marriage and it's not the first union with Rochester. Even if he hadn't been married, it's I still don't think she would have had that same spiritual fulfillment that she gets with it now because they've both been on 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 such long journeys, um, spiritual journeys, and yeah. found themselves and found God. Um, not, not that Jane didn't have God, but I think she's found, you know, more, more God and, and more kind of ideas of, of, of religion and, and, and what religion can mm-hmm. bring to individuals, to communities and, and, and you know, to, to marriage. Um, so I think, yes, that's exactly what St. John thinks. You know, you are completely being carnal and, and earthy and what I'm doing is so much better. And that's just not true. And that's not how that's not how Jane sees it. And I think that's what Bronte's getting at because when we get to that final, you know, what ha- what what's happened with Jane, what's happened with the Rivers girls, what's happened with Sinjin, his his story is so hollow. It's mm-hmm. so it's so hollow. There's there's nothing in the center yeah. of it. You know, but we, and end, I, but I, we end with it, and that's trouble. But we end with him. Oh, <laughs> um, um, but I think, I think, yeah, like Mary said, like Jane is very much of the opinion of what's why did God create the world? Why are we on the earth? Because we are at a point where there's a lot of people starting to preach this idea of being on earth is a test. It's a test of of extreme resistance. You know, you must live as pious and as spiritually and as minimalist as possible. You know, we get a lot of these very kind of like we we have this kind of resurgence of of kind of like quite extreme protestantism um, and obviously like puritanism and things like that and it's like yeah no we're supposed to we're supposed to suffer and we're supposed to live spiritually and godly and and Jane's kind of saying well yeah but why do we love why why are we on earth why do we have children and families if that's what kind of God wanted for us so I think that's kind of that again Mm -hmm. when you compare the stories of the 
these three women of this family to this and, and also Adele to what happens to Sinjin, this beautiful carved from stone man. There's, you know, in the particularly in the last two kind of pages, there's something very stark between the two happy endings, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, we, we can definitely say more about it, but I think what, what you get with Jane and, and, and her marriage with Rochester and then what you get with St. John and, and what he does is two different kind of interpretations of, of, of Jesus, essentially. You have the idea of suffering and you have the idea of servitude. Um, and I think what Bronte is trying to do is to say that it's not that one of these is right, it's that you have to find what works for you and you can serve God and, and and find spiritual nourishment through you know whichever um but but for Jane it is very much marriage um which is you know a covenant covenant made yeah. in in a church and also this idea of servitude which I think she gets from you know from the gospels and and from Jesus whereas that idea of suffering um which again we see a bit with Helen um, but you know, Sinjin also pursues relentlessly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a different, different interpretation. And again, parallel readings, you know, we can look at this in a certain way, but I think we also have to look at what did Bronte, what was Bronte trying to say mm-hmm. in, in that way. Although I think that, you know, obviously Sinjin is well, yeah, and, and <laughs> I, I think she makes a, a like like with Helen, you know, with Helen Burns, Helen can't choose. So like Helen, so mm-hmm. Helen, that so that doctrine of, of what is it, endure and forbearance, where because she can't choose, she has to endure. Sinjin can choose mm-hmm. and chooses suffering. And as valuable as as Jane Eyre, the narrator, says that that is, it's also pretty clear that he's choosing to suffer and she's choosing to be happy. Um, yeah. And which which do you want, reader? <laughs> Which is such a, like, I feel like such an archetype. Like, it even reminds me of uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character in 500 Days of Summer, this kind of, like, misconception, both secular and religious, that suffering somehow, choosing to suffer, somehow gives worth, you know. And, you know, you kind of get this idea that Helen would probably laugh at St. John because you know, she has no choice. She's in this awful school. She's got this terminal yeah. disease. She's going to die young. She's doing her best, you know? <laughs> she's doing her best with what she's got. And and Sinjin has, you know, he has, there, there are things in his life that aren't great. They struggle. But he has all of these things that Jane is like, oh my God, this is all I've ever wanted. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I suffer. I must suffer. <laughs> and it's this very kind of, I think she's really, Bronte is really pushing back against that kind of, it's, it kind of comes out of the hero of sensibility and sentimentality. The kind of like, oh, you know, I must suffer and suffering is the only true enlightenment and true spirituality. Because you get it both in the secular enlightenment and in the, the Christian enlightenment and and Jane just kind of rejects that and is like, well, I have suffered from as early as I can remember, and I'm going to choose to be happy because I don't think that's what God wants for me. Mm-hmm. Well, we have I have to do a mid break, and we're we we'll, we'll probably go a little long today. So, but and before I went and, and the mid break, I will announce the next Sunday, uh, the next book that we're going to be doing for our weekly show. Um, but, but so, but before I want to get to that, I, I want to hit Adele first because, you know, now Jane says you have not quite forgotten little Adele. Have you reader? Well, kind of, but you have too, because you barely mentioned her since, you know, in forever now, like when she goes off on her own, it's not about, Oh, I miss Adele. It's about, Oh, I miss Rochester. Um, and now about now, now she's going to tell us what happened to Adele who Rochester has sent to school. Um, and uh, she went, she, she got, she obtained leave, Jane did, of Mr. Rochester. Um, still that relationship is, is maybe, not, maybe not quite equal. I, I didn't notice that before, that she had obtained leave of Mr. Rochester to go see her at the school where he had placed her. Uh, her frantic joy at beholding me again moved me much. She looked pale and thin. She said she was not happy. 
I found the rules of the establishment were too strict. It's course of study too severe for a child her, of her age. I took her home with me. And um, uh, Jane knows what this is like. She's been through this experience. Um, and maybe Rochester put her in just a terrible place as Lowood was for her. Um, and Jane means to become her governess once more, but I found this impracticable. My time and cares were now required by another. My husband needed them all. Um, and so she finds a better school for her, a school conducted on a more indulgent system near enough to permit my visiting her often. Um, she takes care that she's, you know, never once for anything. And she gives her, as she says, a sound English education corrected in a great measure her, which corrected in a great measure, her French defects. <laughs> And when she left school, I found her a pleasing and obliging companion, docile, good-tempered, and well-principled. Like, she has to make, she has to shape Adele. She's got to get all the French out of her um, and, and make her, but, but it's that docile, good-tempered, well-principled, I don't know, like all the things I admired in you, Jane, were that like that rebellious streak and not afraid to challenge authority. And I feel bad that that, that I, I, her view of Adele here is not what I wished it would be. Yeah, it does kind of question as well, though, like what does Jane consider to be those qualities? Because I feel like her perception of that is probably quite different to society's perception of that because I think about the way that she perceived the you know the Blanche and the other kind of denizens of town and high society compared to you know how they probably were perceived in high society um I don't know if that's just wishful thinking on my part because I want to believe <laughs> that Jane raises Adele to be this you know kind of like happy like empowered young girl um, but we have had this kind of idea all the way through that, that Adele has this like frivolousness. I mean, she's only little, but like she's the little, thing that seems, know, to yeah. ups that seems to upset Jane about Adele is that she like, you know, it's, it's the ribbons and the, 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 the style and not the substance. And she the wants vanity. more. Yeah. 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 And that she wants more for her. Um, and I kind of hope that kind of, yeah, hope slash, uh, see that perhaps that's what Jane's getting at, yeah. that it's more about, I freed her from that vanity, that kind of, you know, lack of substance. And now she can be happy and good tempered and whatever. It's just that docile world yeah. that always gets me. <laughs> it is. And, and she's clearly... She's not like their adopted daughter. She's like a dependent. She is like someone who they're, who they were happy to help and to give everything to, but there's a difference, right? Yeah. Like they're not going to accept her as like one of the family. And I think for contemporary readers of that novel, they would have been like, that seems, well, that's so wonderful that they're doing that for, but I, but I feel like especially in, in, in our, in our age, that seems like a disservice to this port, to this girl yeah. that you should bring her into want, your family. Yeah. We want her to like embrace her as a daughter, but what's interesting again is I, it makes me think of like novels like Pamela where, so in Pamela, um, Mr. B is revealed to have an illegitimate daughter and Pamela is like, Oh my God, I love her. She's great. She can be our child like and take takes her in and that for a contemporary reader you're kind of like oh like yes being a stepmother like you should if you if your partner has a child you should be a good step parent but this is a hidden child that he waits until after they are married to tell her that he has and I wonder if there's an element and because there's that ambiguity about who Adele is and what Rochester's connection to Adele is. There's that kind of, we only really have his word for it and we're still never 100% sure kind of like what the situation is there. 
she's more Jane's relationship with Adele is like that of Miss Temple to her she's this very important person in her life Jane says you know I gave her every kindness I had it in my power to offer and she repaid it to me and I think for a for a for the time that's a very powerful relationship of a woman using her position as governess or teacher to empower and enable a younger a, a girl and raise a girl and I think you're I think you have this kind of like oh isn't this wonderful like because boys have tutors and mentors and educators and and you know men have proteges and prodigies and you know you don't get that as a as a female homosocial re- relationship so I think that's what she's trying to do here for me I see that as a sort of like this should be something that that and it's not existing there should be that homosocial relationship between a girl and a woman who is her educator her teacher her her guide Mm -hmm. and I think that perhaps is it's rejecting that kind of the you embrace the man's history regardless and putting power on one of the very few roles for women which was teacher or governess um to another young girl so it's that kind of you know Jane giving what she got from Miss Temple to Adele for Jane would be a very powerful relationship but as a modern reader we do have that thing of like we want to see because you got married to Rochester so now you could fulfill that role if you so choose but I mean she does it in her way (laughs) it's it's a matter of degree that I'm that I'm noticing here not a matter of certainly neglect right yeah, yeah. We want we want to see that kind of like happy ending, I think, as a modern reader. And I, I wonder, like, I think I think that sometimes like if I read this in like the 1850s, would I be absolutely blown away by the the sincerity and, and the kind of like the the power of that relationship between two women? Um, I wonder if that's something we've lost a little bit just by the nature of, of society moving on. Mm-hmm. Um because you know there is no grand tour, there is no you know woman genius taking you know there's no here's the the female philosopher and her and her like protege and her disciple mm-hmm. um and is that kind of what's happening here is it more kind of is it is it embracing that relationship between teacher and pupil well and but- it's certainly as a governess this is this is Jane getting to be a governess with power and to like to say like this is what my charge really needs and getting to achieve that and a governess with governess meaning never get to do yeah we don't get any governesses with meaning governesses yeah. in fiction are either abused like in Anne Bronte's fiction or they're by the wayside they're just these women that exist the only time we ever really get it is in Austin's Emma where we have um a governess who is is like a mother a mother a best friend everything to to the young mm-hmm. girl in question yeah we very very rarely get that as an education the the value on that is placed on the companionship that those two women have not on the education that they that they share and education being a back and forth um governess is a kind of the the educational aspects is kind of like well they're women teaching women so <laughs> that's interesting oh, austin that does great. that in emma i'd forgotten that and then she really does um mm-hmm. yeah yeah she does it's just a very different it's a very different type of connection um still a very important one though all righty mary anything to add to adele before i hit a mid-break I, I, th- I mean, I think you've covered it. It's exactly, you know, it's just, it's exactly what Jane didn't have when when she was at Lowood, someone who could step in and from, from outside and, and take charge. Yeah. And it's, I think that's that's a really interesting perspective that Jane is able to be for Adele. What, there wasn't, you know, there is that relationship with Miss Temple, but Miss Temple could only do so much. Whereas yeah. Jane, because of her new wealth and because of her position now, she she has the means to... To make sure that Adele is properly looked after. Um, mm-hmm. Very and, empowered. And, yeah. So, all righty. Well, everyone, over the last 28 weeks, we have brought, uh, actually, it was 28 and 30 weeks, uh, we have brought Sundays with Jane Eyre to you for free. 
So if you would like to support the Rosenbach through donation, you can do so at our website. And since the novel was published in 1847, we're asking for donations of $18.47 to support the show. I'd like to thank those who have donated um, in the last week. That was Anita. Anita L. from Sewell, New Jersey, Melanie A. from Havertown, PA, and Pamela F. from Huntington Valley, PA. And you could also become a member like Catherine F. in Willoughby, Ohio did. I absolutely appreciate everyone who has joined the Rosenbach and donated to the Rosenbach through the run of this show. And I'm asking you if you want to show your appreciation one last time while the show runs uh i would be very grateful uh it really helps us do this show and will help us do another one which i'll announce in just a moment when this course when this show ends we're going to have a bronte course coming up um that's going to meet actually on sunday afternoons in the same time slot um uh 2 p.m eastern time here uh in in uh, on the east coast in the u.s um, and it's called The Brontes Revisited, Reappraised, Reimagined. And it features three people who have been co-hosts on this show. Uh, Claire O'Callaghan, who will uh, talk about uh, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. Uh, Sophie Franklin, uh, who was just on the last episode. She'll talk about Charlotte Bronte's Villette. And Adele Hay, who will talk about Anne Bronte's Tenant of Wildfeld Hall. And then there'll be a final session after that one where all three of them are on talking about the Brontes. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. It is more than half full right now. Um, so if you want to join, you can go to our website at the Rosenbach, uh, Rosenbach.org uh, and look that up and join that class. Um, I'll be there too, because I just enjoy, you know, being in it, but I don't have to do this, uh, which is really nice. And it'll be like a meeting stuff. So it'd be like a class. So you'll all be on the screen too. So you can, so there'll be some discussion about uh, these great Bronte novels. Um, I want to thank our uh, book sponsor for this uh, series, our official bookseller, Novel Idea on Pashunk. Uh, visit them in South Philadelphia or visit them online where you can get, you know, all kinds of Bronte books, especially online. You could order them through their store. Um, uh, and, uh, and thank you, uh, Novel Idea, for being the official bookseller for the show. And now... <laughs> Let me tell you what our next book will be. <clears throat> Before I do, though, <laughs> we are actually going to move the show from Sunday afternoons to Monday evenings. Now, I know that that will make it more difficult for maybe people in our overseas audience to tune in live because then it's like 11 o'clock at night when it starts or you know, something like that. So, or no, I'm sorry. It's like seven o'clock at night, you know, or, no, no, it'll be that late. It'll be like 11 because we're going to start later because we're going to, we're going to do the shows on Mondays, 7 PM Eastern. Um, so I, I appreciate all of you who have tuned in live, you know, overseas and in other time zones and could do that but we really think that we'll have a much bigger audience for the show if we move it off of Sundays. I mean, the Sunday afternoon time slot was only chosen for our first show on Dracula because it was the pandemic. Everybody was home, you know, and, and we thought that that would be a, a great time to do it. Um, and I think in a world, you know, with everything opening up and hopefully, and that will get to continue. Um, I, I think people are far less available on weekend afternoons to do a show. And that it's, it's the biggest chunk of our audience is, is it's still afternoons when they watch it. So, um, so the new show will be on Mondays at seven Eastern and it's going to start in September. Now, the criteria for choosing, I know I draw it out even more. We choose a book for this show that we have first that we have a really strong connection to in our collection. Um, when we first did Dracula, obviously we have Stoker's notes and so many, you know, different things attached to vampires and Stoker, that that really made sense. Frankenstein, we have the first edition of Frankenstein, all this other stuff. But we also want to choose a book that we think is having a really great interest to our audience too. That um, there are there are some there are some great great books that we have that I just don't know how much of an audience we'll be able to generate for a show. So because that's what happens over time. So um, 
we began with monsters. We did Dracula and Frankenstein. And then we kind of kept a connection with those books, the Gothic connection. And, and I got the ghoul guides to then continue for all of them um, by choosing Jane Eyre because we had the Gothic connection, Jane Eyre. But we're going to move on from the Gothic for the next one. So, you know, sorry, you know, only Gothic people, but, but, but believe me, you, you, you should love this next book anyway. Uh, it is a book that is a huge favorite of mine. Uh, it is a huge favorite of so many readers. Uh, it is one of the most beloved novels of all time. Our next book will be Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Um, I love that book. I have taught that book. Uh, I've taught that book at the Rosenbach. Um, the Rosenbach has the first edition of Pride and most of the other novels of Austin. Um, like it's weird because we have a sense and sensibility that it's it was like a fraudulent first edition. It has a first edition title page, but the actual text, the second edition was put together. The rest we have are all first editions. We also have a first American edition of Pride and Prejudice, which was uh, called Elizabeth Bennett or Pride and Prejudice. And it was published in Philadelphia in 1832. We have a copy of that on our shelves. So it'll be real nice to do that too. Um, we're going to begin on September 19th. Um, you can go to the Rosenbach website right now and register for it. It's been live all morning and you didn't know that it was on the website. If you had done <laughs> some deep dives, you could have found it online. Um, but uh, we're, um, since we're moving, we're, call we're, we're calling it Austin Mondays. Um, and we will have a regular, I'm going to go back to the, to the other format that I did for Frank's the Dragon. I have a regular group of rotating co-hosts again. And I can announce my very first co-host and that will be Dr. Lauren Nixon, who has a very strong Austin connection. I'm sorry <laughs> to break up the band here. Um, <clears throat> I, I did ask Mary, but she's not as, you know, not as enthused with her, not as into done research. Lauren, you're very, Lauren, your very first bio that you sent me for the first show included the lines, in a previous life, Lauren worked in museums and has written on the life of works of Jane Austen. Rumor has it she is a renegade Austen scholar, <laughs> but these reports are currently unconfirmed. We're confirming it. Um, I may or may not have <laughs> once been blacklisted by a major Jane Austen society. Um for being uh, an upstart rebel. Um, but yes, I worked at the Jane Austen Centre in Bath for a number of years. My first two books were about Jane Austen. Um, I've done multiple Jane. I used to be um, a kind of cast member at the Jane Austen Festival. So I was one of the people that would have to dress up and pretend to be you know, one of the the kind of Regency girls. I always had to be the silly little sister because I was the youngest. Um, but Jane Austen has has been my kind of. Uh, it was my connection. It was my uh, my gateway drug to the Gothic. I got into the Gothic because Northanger Abbey. Northanger Abbey. Um, yeah. I once got in a lot of trouble for telling an Australian reporter that my name was Catherine Morland um, at a Jane Austen festival. Um, so. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, yeah I played a prank on a reporter who had come to the festival and didn't had, had basically just got on a free holiday and tried to get the staff to um to to tell her everything she needed to know instead of doing her work uh but I am so excited I Good. love Pride and Prejudice and I'm really excited to be back with you guys Good. again it, despite it, the fact I will not have my left arm <laughs> yes Mary um uh, it, 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 it's, it's a book that I really love and, I, and I've done it so many times and, and we'll, have a, we'll have a very easy time filling up many weeks with the show. It's actually going to be 24 weeks, um, September 19th. It'll start, it'll go to March 13. Um, if you do your math, that's 26 weeks. I'll take two, I'll take two weeks off in between. Halloween, I'm not working on and, uh, and, and day after Christmas too. But um, the, uh, the show's um, format will change slightly in that, the first half hour of the show are going to be interviews and features about Austin topics connected to the book, interviewing scholars, and then we'll do one hour of the conversational annotation with the text that, that we really love to do after that. So that'll be the format going forward. Um, 
And um, yeah, and I'll get to be Mr. Bennett, the good Mr. Bennett. As, as many of you people know me personally, I have five daughters. So um, I get to, you know, I have those jokes going on in my life. Um, but uh, I am not as disregarding as Mr. Bennett is <laughs> of his child's happiness, I hope. Uh, my wife is no Mrs. Bennett. And our, our, none of our girls are Lydia's. They're all Lizzie's. So there you go. <laughs> Um, uh, Charlotte did not love Pride and Prejudice, Charlotte Bronte. Um, <clears throat> she had uh, read it, uh, she says, uh, to, to, in a letter to uh, 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 George Lewis, who had told her she should read it. She said, I got the book and studied it. And what did I find? An accurate daguerreotype portrait of a commonplace face, a carefully fenced, highly cultivated garland garden with neat borders and delicate flowers. And um, uh, so there's some, there'll be some really wonderful things we could do in and talking about and then she wrote about another letter too so we can really compare charlotte bronte's you know uh opinion of jane austen walter um, scott and tennyson loved her <laughs> yeah absolutely so um all right everyone so pride and prejudice september 19th we're moving to mondays and uh monday evenings and uh, i hope you will all join us for that so there'll be lots more announcements about if you register now um, I'll send it between now and uh, the, the start date in September. We'll give regular updates. Oh, and there is a Facebook page to it as well, which I will post the um, uh, the 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 Facebook group. Yeah, somebody even asked about. It. There'll be a Facebook group for it, which is either live now or will be live soon, and and we'll post the uh, uh, the link to that. I um, might even share some of the many photos of me in full Regency garb ooh. from my days as a Jane Austen Center employee. <laughs> that we want, definitely. <laughs> so, so we're calling it Austin Mondays. So um, if you want to find us on uh, Facebook, um, we'll, we'll be there soon. And we'll have a group for it and everything. So we can do that conversation just like we've done with the other shows. And, and the Jane Eyre Facebook group will continue as well as, as the other groups we did with Dragon and Frankenstein are still, you know, have a, are, are still very busy. We'll, we'll still get to do that stuff. Okay. Let us finish this book. Um, because this is, this is the great paragraph here. When he went, when one of you, I have now been married 10 years. Why don't one of you read this? This is like the big romantic, you know, marriage. How this is, this is the kind of thing that, that people who are really reading this book for that. Here's the big focus on it before we get to Sinjin button in again. So Mary or Lauren, why don't you want to read that? I have now been married 10 years. You go, Mary. Oh, going to. Okay. I have now been married 10 years. I know what it is to live entirely for and with what I love best on earth. I hold myself supremely blessed, blessed beyond what language can express, because I am my husband's life as fully as he is mine. No woman was ever nearer to her mate than I am, ever more absolutely bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. I know no weariness of my Edward's society. He knows none of mine any more than we each do of the pulsation of the heart that beats in our separate bosoms. Consequently, we are ever together. To be together is for us to be at once as free as in solitude, as gay as in company. We talk, I believe, all day long. To talk to each other is but a more animated and an audible thinking. All my confidence is bestowed on him. All his confidence is devoted to me. We are precisely suited in character. Perfect concord is the result. Perfect concord. This sounds like my marriage. Um, I have <laughs> now been married 10 years. And I'm not being ironic. I mean, this is the, you know, this is a, a really um, uh, idyllic portrait um, that, that, that she's giving the readers here. But the first thing we get is it's 10 years. Um, so that that question finally gets answered in this novel, that that's the perspective that she has had in looking back on all these events is someone that's been through all this. And now it's 10 years since that day that they were married. Um, 
I end the shows with that, you know, with a, a take on that, uh, what it is to live entirely for and with what I love best on earth. Um, and that for me is her, I mean, that that's her choice as opposed to, you know, going off with Sinjin or supposing or, or, or choosing anything else. She could choose to be on her own and just live with Diane and marry, you know, or, or at least until they get married um, and, and live a kind of life any any life that she wants to live she can now choose because she has been given that financial independence and what she chooses is is to be with the person that you know she feels um uh the most for um what she loves best on earth it's also a very it, it, it makes it makes the novel very victorian in a sense too then doesn't like it's a domestic happiness mm -hmm. that she is described here with also and, and mary maybe you could talk about this these very strongly you know um uh, religious images right this bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh absolutely and and i think this is this is what we were kind of talking a little bit about earlier so yeah bone bone of, bone of his bone flesh of my of his flesh it, it's it's a clear reference to genesis 2 uh, which is the second of two creation stories in in genesis and it's often the one um that that people cite when they are talking about, you know, different roles that that women and men are equal, but they have different roles, um, and it eventually kind of becomes what's known as complementarianism, uh, mm -hmm. which isn't really nineteenth century thing. It's more of a kind of like late twentieth century. But you can see the kind of germs of it in in a lot of kind of nineteenth century, such as this kind of thing, um, where you have the idea that man was created first woman was created second out of man and therefore you have this kind of complementary relationship where woman is 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 kind of created to to serve or or, or in that kind of hierarchical way um, that, that isn't necessarily there in Genesis 1 and I always think it's a really conscious choice when people specifically reference Genesis 2 because I, I always think well why not Genesis 1 because that's the verse where you get man and woman created at the same time. So, for example, um, John Milton's Paradise Lost specifically um, chooses to rework Genesis 2 as opposed to Genesis 1. His Eve is created second out of the flesh of Adam. And then you do have this kind of complementarian kind of uh, theology where woman is, is supposed to to, to be under man in, in that kind of hierarchy. This isn't exactly that. Um, what you get is a more kind of mutual respect companionship, but there is still that idea of complementary roles um, and the idea that what, um, what um, Jane is doing is, is a reflection of that. Here is this kind of perfect Edenic-like relationship of Adam and Eve, um, where you have this, you know, perfect relationship and and they can live happily forever after and that idea of you know love companionship and Jane being in in service of um Rochester in in the way that she is in service of God she is helping him uh, and he is helping her and and it's a uh, their roles are different but they're you know coming from a place of love and spiritualness and he's used this too he's 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 used this very same he's, he's talked about you know being tied to her you mm -hmm. know um and 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 also it's very much alluded to in their in their first you know uh in in the proposal where it's it's in the orchard um the serpent doesn't visit but the lightning visits you know instead um but we yeah. get those 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 images have, have been throughout this novel this garden of eden adam and on the paradise lost references all through this book are here absolutely yeah and and this is a kind of kind of um a, a continuation and a, and a resolution of that idea of you know there is a string in my heart and it pulls to you that that idea that they are connected um and and it is more of a kind of um spiritual fleshliness i think um mm -hmm. that idea that they are made of the same materials um in a, in a way that that complements each other uh, and, and I think putting my contemporary hat on, I have issues with that, but, and, and I have issues with that kind of, um, you know, theology, but if I take that off for a minute, I can see in the context of this, it's really beautiful, um, and it is meant to be 
in that kind of oh yes of course like you know this is one of the reasons why Jane is so busy and she can't do anything with Adele because she is so completely devoted to the care of of Mr Rochester who is disabled and and needs her care um, and she's happy to do that and and that for her is a kind of in in being in service of that um sacrificing something so that she can attend to her husband's needs because he is disabled and because he needs somebody like that and, and that she can do it with love and and care in a way that a servant or a, you know somebody else or even another wife couldn't do um so yeah this idea that they have this um idealized perfect relationship that that does stem from this kind of biblical yeah spiritual but flesh material relationship is- she'll have children and she'll forget them about them then though like as soon as she has her own kids she'll probably be all over her kids she'll be total you know 19th century i guess it wouldn't be a helicopter mom she'll be like a governess mother you but, know but this, is, this, is, this, is, this is where this theology yeah. you know and, and complementarianism this, this is where it kind of ends up the idea of family yeah. and this is what i was saying you know it's the idea that there are still you can still get spiritual nourishment on earth and what are what are humans doing on earth um, and it's the idea of raising the family and Christ, you know, to be a Christian and, and to raise a family is to do, that's to do good. Um, and, and that's the path that, that Jane has chosen. Yeah. She hasn't gone to become a missionary. She's staying here. She's raising her good Christian family. Um, well, so, she ends yeah. that paragraph after, after that, you know, bone of bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. She talks about how we talk all day long like that's what we do we're just together Mm -hmm. constantly interacting in a a very equal way which is what which is what shocked her when she came to be governess at thornfield to begin with that rochester would wanted to have conversations with her and this is something that she had never had in her life up to that i mean she's only 19 but still i mean in her experiences she had never had that and now she gets to live a life where she gets to have this um relationship with someone and and not feel like um you know not feel like uh the the poor orphan girl who's we're just gonna you know move off into the corner that she gets to have this full life with him and perfect concord is the result of it as it should be yeah yeah no it should be it's an example um of you know happy relationships you know communication is key and love is key and you you know if those aren't your starting points th- those wouldn't have been the, the starting points for for her and Sinjin, yeah. Sinjin. she yeah. wouldn't have had any you know any kind of concord no. with, with Sinjin was clear been, that it wasn't going to be that yeah <laughs> yeah there, there would have been some communication but not not entirely because he would have been busy doing doing what he wanted to do and there would have been no love there so yeah here here is what you need you know there's there's that's interesting because in a weird way, because Sinjin wants her to be his helpmeet. He wants her to only assist him. And she says no. But with Rochester, she can be the person who assists him because he's willing to accept her equally. It, Is that the difference? Yeah, it kind of rejects the angel of the house, um, which <laughs> comes a little bit later than this. It's starting to become an ideal. I mean, it's always been an ideal but the actual term the angel of the house yeah. um is a later concept but it's it's starting to you know it's it's become it's a later term but the concept thing. is already there concept, yeah exactly yeah. the concept is is kind of there right right from the beginning and particularly i would say from the georgian period where men become start to have more to do with their estates and the idea is that a good man is a gentleman farmer is conscious of what's going on at this point we have a lot of men who who and obviously they don't have the house anymore but that kind of you know what's the woman's role what's the man's role and the women's role the wife's role becomes a very silent one mm-hmm. um you know it's it's kind of you were expected to discuss matters with your wife in terms of your wife goes that's a great idea darling you should definitely do that and then tells the cook what to make um you know it's that kind of like the husband speaks to the wife. The wife does not necessarily converse with the husband. And, and this kind of domesticity that we have, which is a very idealized, perfect domesticity, is again based on this very equal principle of conversation 
um, and communication, which is a, which is a, you know, they're equal and active participants, like with the marriage and the wedding, you know, they're not, it's not, he speaks to me, I listen, and then I go and tell the servants and the children and, and you know, because that's usually what it would be, the, you know, the husband speaks to the wife, and then the wife goes, okay, this is how we manage the household, this is how we go about things, um, and certain things you left to your wife, and it would be like, oh, isn't my wife so, so smart, isn't my wife so, you know, clever, but yeah. <sighs> communication constant daily communication because we're just coming out of a period where there was this whole panic about whether or not too much chat with women could make you effeminate you know this is one of the reasons that boys get sent to school at 10 or 11 because you can only have them educated by mothers or governesses for a certain amount of time or it's going to hinder their masculinity so for her to be his conversation partner always is again, this kind of, it's very conventional in its domesticity of man and wife being completely devoted to one another in the eyes of God. But it's super radical because he doesn't have this traditional conventional male society where he gets his conversation. You know, he's Mm -hmm. not going to the coffee house. He's not going to the gentleman's club. He's not having hunting parties or whatever it might be that he used to do he has Jane. He doesn't need another conversation partner yeah. to be and, spiritually and mentally enriched. And in the next paragraph, because of his blindness, then she is, she is literally his interpreter for the world. Um, you know, you know, she says, literally, I was uh, what he so often called the apple of his eye. He saw nature. He saw books through me that she reads to him all the time. She describes everything out in the world as they're outside. So she becomes the conduit with through which he experiences the entire world. Mm-hmm. Um, and that blindness, he says, it continued for two years, but then he starts being able to see again. Well, you see, he's lost one eye, and it's, 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 and it's the, so through the one eye, um, he, it, it's, it's, he, he tells her, he asks her one day that, um, uh, you know, are you wearing something glittery around your neck? And then he starts to see kind of, a little better the she says for some time he had fancied the obscurity clouding one eye was becoming less dense and now he was sure of it and he he and they go to see a, a an a eminent oculist in london and eventually recovers the sight of that one eye and he can see very distinct very distinctly and he, he still can't read or write much but but he's fine with being able to say which is all interesting too because is it at this has has Charlotte Bronte's father already had he has he's already gone through he had severe cataracts and they had to take him for surgery because he had gone through this long period where his eyesight was going away and then they took him and and fixed his eyesight um she's this it's 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 in a sense this kind of I can imagine Patrick, her Charlotte's father, getting the end and thinking like yeah there's making a little nod to me maybe in a sense there um that he has had his vision corrected. This is something that's not fantastical. This is something that could actually happen. Um, another w- reason, another way that this novel starts to differentiate itself and that it's actually a novel. It's not a romance of the past. There's no, it's not miraculous that his eyesight comes back. It is, this is a real thing that can happen to people. At the same time, you do also uh, get this sentence uh, on that occasion he again with a full heart acknowledged that god had tempered judgment with mercy thank you um which uh yeah and i think this is one of the things that i still have issues with mm-hmm. providence but it but it's also this um i think problematic way of, of reading disability um as as something that that is a, a punishment that you can then yeah. also be, you know, redeemed from or, or, or rewarded with um, the kind of removal of, of, of that. And I, and I think that is something that we should bear in mind that um, it's, you know, to, to see disability in that way is, is, um, is problematic. Um, Here's a fascinating question from uh, Nikki. Um, do you think Jane's independence has anything to do with there being a married queen on the throne? Um, this is something that frequently happens um, uh, with, you know, early modern studies with Shakespeare, Elizabethan age, where you constantly see this reflection of Elizabeth in, in plays or other works and this idea of this powerful female. Um, 
but I don't find that very much in the Victorian age that, that Victoria has, has cast herself as powerful, but yet not in a domestic sphere. I don't know. We, we, you guys want to take that question? So this, it's, this, the answer is probably a lot bigger than I could kind of get into. The, it does kind of link to, there obviously um, in a few sentences from that, um, we find out that Diana has married a naval officer um, who is um, gallant, like he's a gallant, a gallant officer. Yeah, which <laughs> specifically naval officer. That super that distinction between an army officer and a navy officer super important uh, because we are in the real age of empire here, and the navy mm. is the you know the embodiment of all that the empire is it's what enables the empire it what maintains the empire the difference between elizabeth and victoria is that victoria is the inheritor of an empire and elizabeth is the almost the founder of an empire we already have empirical beginnings pre-elizabethan but the elizabethan is when the empire begins that's when the expansion starts to happen. That's when she's compete like Elizabeth's court is directly competing with Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, it's directly competing with, you know, with Spain and Portugal and France um, and even Holland. And it's, you know, it's trying to be an empire. You have things like the Armada sinking, um, you know, this this idea of, of the Elizabeth, the emperor, you know, you have all those pictures of her with the globe. Yeah. She is very much presented as the virgin queen, soon to be empress. Obviously, that doesn't happen. Victoria is, is never intended to be queen. Yes, like Elizabeth, but she is essentially born an empress. She inherits this empire. So her marrying her kind of having domesticity doesn't have the same her figure in in literature does not have the same impact that Elizabeth does because there's already parliament there's already this this separation we have you know the constitutional monarchy we've just had the French Revolution and the Napoleonic so we have this whole emphasis on England is a constitutional monarchy. Great Britain is a nation that values democracy and enlightenment. So she doesn't ever reach this mythical status that Elizabeth mm -hmm. reaches. We actually have far more of Victoria as a character post-Victorian. Neo-Victorian is so much more interested with Victoria as an individual and her family. Mm -hmm. It doesn't bleed through in the same way because there's not that same crisis we have a lot of crisis when king george is is in his madness we have a lot of crisis about the father is king and the king is father and what does that mean because the nation is unstable mm -hmm. by the time victoria takes the throne we have this you know violently colonial empire that is is you know ruling the waves so Victoria gets a lot of things named after her. She gets a lot of reverence, but she doesn't have that same icon. Um, and, and the I family is stable too. Yeah, there's so the many children. She has so many children. There's Even when no Prince anxiety. Albert dies, it's still, there's so many children that there's, yeah, no, there's no anxiety, anxiety about there. And the other thing is people, people were kind of grossed out by her and her domesticity they didn't think it made her very regal they didn't like how in love she was with her husband mm -hmm. they didn't like how they thought it made her weak you know there was a lot of kind of like oh like we don't want that we don't want that kind of, of marriage on scene from our queen so I don't think it I don't think it bleeds through in the same way because it's a very, very different situation. And I think, if anything, um, Jane's domesticity is kind of like, and her independence is almost like the antithesis to Victoria's because people perceived her as unable to be without Albert. You know, she was, and um, we know that she, <laughs> I don't like to be like, oh, she was hysterical, but we know from her letters that Victoria struggled and, you know, particularly after he passed away, mm -hmm. 
and and if anything that's another of the things that makes Jane radical is that you know she has that independence so yeah I weirdly there being a happily married queen didn't have the positive impact that you would think it might have yeah. on fiction and society because I, I don't I'm find not, it in literature I don't find no, that and, same influence and I'm not a 19th centuryist and um, a lot of Victorian scholars will be able to say a lot more on this than I can but from my perspective as someone that looks at nation and empire um, it's very very different um, and you don't get that same you don't get that same kind of empowerment you don't get that kind of like one singular female virgin queen type character mm -hmm. Um, there's not suddenly this this boom in women in fiction who are domestic. Um, if anything, it's a bit like, oh, is, oh, does does being does being domestic make you less independent? Like we're not sure about this. <laughs> well, this all reminds me. It's going to be very interesting to talk about Regency uh, during uh, Austen's Pride and Prejudice and the influence of that kind of you know monarchy. So yeah. So. All right. Prince Regent but, and I have a very fraught relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as Austin had with him herself. Um, the uh, but uh, all right, let's let's fit now. Like all this, like we have this huge paragraph about you know their the, the perfect concord of the relationship, and this is it. Seemed like that was the end of the novel. Perfect concord as the result would have been a great final, you know you know, phrase to end this novel on for what Jane Eyre, what Charlotte Bronte is trying to present about this relationship as it goes along, but she doesn't. So um, instead we get St. John for the final, what, three paragraphs, two paragraphs all about St. John and the last paragraph are St. John's words, his words and the novel. Um, she talks about how he he left England, went to India, and and then is nothing but praise for him. Firm, faithful, devoted, full of energy, zeal, truth, labors for his race. Very very problematic, um, but also he hews down the giant, hews down like a giant the prejudices of creed and caste that encumber it. So he's not just out there preaching Jesus; he's out spreading civilization to the to the savages. You know. Um, is the way I think he he sees it, um, and then she talks about how he's uh, he's unmarried. He will never marry, um, and his glorious son hastens to its setting. She is just waiting for the letter that will arrive from a, in a stranger's hand, saying, "You know, St. John Rivers has died." Um, uh, and then it finishes with you know his words. My master has forewarned me daily. He announces more distinctly. Surely I come quickly and hourly. I more eagerly respond. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. Talk about the most surprising end to a novel for me reading it. And I don't know if that's my modern perspective or, but it just doesn't seem to fit with everything we've been given. There's so much to unpack in these, to unpack in these three paragraphs, but mm -hmm. Mary, I'll let you start. Sinjin at the end. Why is this novel end with why does this novel end with Sinjin? So, so with with both of our hats on, we have to kind of look at this through like two two kinds of um, you know, perspectives. And in, in the 19th century, the colonial project of empire was seen as 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 one of Britain's amazing accomplishments um, and it continued even into the early 20th century um, and the the kind of the image of, of St. John going to India and, and trying to um, spread you know both Christianity but also you know civilization is exactly it, it's exactly British it, it's, civilization it's British civilization and I think you know even now we're still unpacking the harm that that specifically British, um, the British Empire, but other kinds of European empires have done to places like India, but but ev everywhere. And, and I, I cannot emphasize enough how, with our kind of contemporary hat on, everything that he's described and describing is is is, is you know so harmful. 
Um, and an, another, if, another, it just made me think of Black Narcissus, um, which is a really fabulous Gothic film, which is based on a book. Um, and it's set a little bit after it's set in the early early nineteenth century. But it's a it's a group of Anglican nuns who go to the the Himalayas. Um, and they they try and set up again. So it's the second time this is this has um, been tried to do. They try to set up a kind of school um, and a, and a hospital in what was a kind of Indian palace in in the Himalayan mountains. And it, it goes as you would expect, horribly horribly wrong. Um, and and it, it shows I think some of the the, the problems. Of, of that and, and the harm that is caused by, by British missionaries. Um, and I think, I think you cannot divorce um, kind of Christianity from the colonial project. It was at its heart. You also cannot divorce race from it. The idea that it's spreading whiteness um, as the kind of pinnacle of humanity compared to other races. Um, so there's all of these kinds of things that, that even now we are, we, are, we are still unpacking. Um, so that is our kind of, you know, contemporary kind of lens and perspective of it. Like, oh, my gosh, why are you putting this at the end of your beautiful, beautiful romance bu um, book and, and kind of buildings roman about about Jane Eyre? We loved all of that. What it, what is this? Um, but then you you get the idea. Um, his is the exaction of the apostle who speaks, but for Christ, when he says, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, um, which is um, which is from Mark, one of um, Bronte's favorite kind of gospels to quote from. And it's this idea that to deny yourself. Is it? Is, is, that, is that Mark? That's my least favorite gospel. So just <laughs> to rank least, them, just to rank my, them. My least favorite, favorite. My least favorite is John. Um, John oh, is the wildest go. gospel. Um, it, it starts really radically, but John is the most anti-Semitic of the gospels. All right. Um, so John is my least favorite. All right, this is a whole um, other show. <laughs> that's a whole other show. Um, but yeah, it's this. <laughs> the Mary rate the gospels. <laughs> If you want to hear me talk about John, uh, then uh, we can do that another time. But um, yeah, over cocktails, Mark. please. So there okay, you go. we can do that. We can definitely do that. Um, I, you know, John introduces the idea of darkness, the kind of cosmic battle, dark and light, um, mm -hmm. which I would really love to talk about in in light of supernatural. Um, so if anyone wants that, then please do hit me up. Um, but uh, but for this, this one, is, but for this, this is this is Mark, um, and and it's basically you know. Let him deny himself, get rid of all the pleasures and just give yourself over, over to God. You know, none, none of the kind of uh, frivolities or riches of, of everything. You, you go down this path, the path will be thorny. And, and that's how that's how you get to God. Um, again, what I think this novel is trying to do is say that there isn't one prescriptive way to be a Christian or to to kind of to, to live and promote and, and, and be a good Christian. This mm -hmm. is one way. Um, the other kind of ideas, though, is it, it then ends with um, with a lot of stuff from Revelation, um, which I find odd because if you have been paying attention to the, you know who uses what kind of passages, Jane mostly uses Psalms um, and the Gospels and, and often Mark. It's it's Sinjin that you really get all of the kind of revelation and, and the, mm -hmm. the darkness and the doom and all that kind of you know Gothic. Um, gothic language and it's the idea that the end is coming um but what you get with his words uh, my master has forewarned me surely i come quickly and hourly i more eagerly respond amen even so come lord jesus um which is the kind of end of revelation um and it comes at the end if anyone has read the book of revelation you'll know it's a very wild ride there's lots of stuff um, thrown into that book but at the end of it you have this kind of vision um, of a kind of metaphorical or symbolic marriage um, between heaven um, and and earth and this is the end of that where it's saying you know Jesus will come and then heaven on earth that's the kind of that's the hoped for aspiration um, of this kind of apocalyptic um, you know theological movement um which is why i think that in 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 some ways it, it is a reflection of jane and mr rochester with this kind of turn to revelation and 
it is meant to be hopeful, you know, hoping for uh, mm-hmm. the re- the return of the Messiah um, and and this this marriage and 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 a reflection of how you know marriage as as a kind of metaphorical relationship between God and and humans um, and that the actual marriage between men and women can be a reflection of that, um, which is why I think you know Jane and Rochester's marriage does have some spiritual nourishment for for Jane and for Mr. Rochester. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's odd. I don't particularly like it. I wouldn't have chosen this to be an ending, but I think that is what Bronte is trying to do, um, mm-hmm. end with a kind of different perspective of religion and also to kind of speak to hope, I guess, a hope for the future. Even, even after she said that, what, with what I love best on earth, like you know the, we then we get the ending with sinjin like no 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 not earth you know beyond earth is where we should look mm-hmm. um you I, kind of get that kind of like bright suns burn you know burn brightest but burn fastest thing as well and it sort of takes it back to helen at the beginning hmm. that we kind of have this idea that jane and rochester will live a long and happy life because for them god is on earth and god is in nature and marriage and children and and family for Sinjin that's not the case and I think that's why you know again I'm not a massive fan of this ending um you know I I find it unsatisfying I don't want Sinjin to be particularly kind of like I don't want a redemption art for him necessarily but yeah like I think there's this thing of like oh well it's almost like Jane's tears are because it's that inevitability of like, he is this beautiful, passionate individual who is unable to find the joy of, of life on earth. Like he cannot look at a flower and go, that's one of God's creations. Isn't that fantastic? Like, and this goes back to kind of what the sublime is all about. You know, you look at a landscape and you are in awe, um, and, you know, it's it's about seeing, like, God in nature and God in the small things, God in the big things. For Sinjin, that's not, it doesn't seem to be a possibility. Like, he, he only thinks in the big picture, whereas Jane thinks in, in this very complex kind of scale. Um, and it's that kind of thing of, like, well, he has, he dies young because yeah. he has to, because he burns too bright and too fast and you know what he wants is to go to like to go to heaven so that's what's going to happen like he doesn't get any joy on this earth and you know it's not the right way to be a christian it's not the wrong way to be a christian it's sad but is it sad if you're sinjin it's what he wants like which as a contemporary like as a modern secular reader you're a bit like oh okay (laughs) And obviously there's some super uncomfortable problematic stuff about empire, but it's an interesting kind of idea about where do you find your faith and where do you find your spirituality? Could this, could this in, in, in a way be even Charlotte Bronte um, clergyman's daughter um, making sure she ends on some kind of, you know, religious spiritual note Um we, we know she's already chosen to keep her name off of this book as, as Cara Bell. Um, and, and that was an issue for her were some of the critics in her preface, you know, to the, to the second edition um, in, in combating that, you know, that this book is not, you know, anti-Christian that, that, and this is why, and she comes up, you know, gives all these reasons why that even, even before that she gets that criticism that she is afraid, maybe it, it could even be subconsciously that, I, I need to end on a religious note as the way she's been brought up. Um, Maybe. There is an element here of a convention. This is quite a conventional ending. Um, Gothic texts and even sentimental texts. So Bernie's fiction often ends like this as well. Um, they often end with this kind of, and it would always be capitalized. You know, like the end of, I think it's a Sicilian romance by Radcliffe is like, and all, and this is that which was right. <laughs> and it's like all in capital letters. And of course, Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility are both taken from the end of, of from the final paragraphs of Bernie novels and they're capitalized. Um, and often these texts would end on this kind of 
this big thinking moment of like this is the conclusion of this text so in some ways what she's doing is just a really con- this is in many ways a really conventional way to end a novel um you end a novel with stability you end a novel with this kind of poignant moment and it makes sense to do it with Sinjin rather than Jane in Rochester because she's only 10 years she's writing 10 years on you know they've only been married for 10 years as far as she says my firstborn so we assume there's more children yeah you know their story's not ending his story is about she's that she's like his story's about to end we also then get that thing of why is she writing it now she, is she writing this because she got that letter from Sinjin and she was like oh he's dying he's gonna die soon the next letter I get from him will be a letter telling me he's dead is that the reason she's written this interesting yeah we have that's to, the time we, frame of what's going on here about the yeah time frame. you know i've said this all the way through hmm. think about the fact that jane's chosen to tell this story at this point in her life this is presented to us as a material text jane Eyre, the protagonist the writer tells us the story from the beginning tells us it's in this set time frame we know how old she is at certain points And all of a sudden, 10 years on, she chooses to tell her life story. There's definitely an element here that it's Sinjin that sparked it. Sinjin is, and and Sinjin is the catalyst for her going back to Rochester in many ways. You know, Sinjin has this strange catalyzing effect in her life. So one, I think it's super conventional you need a, a big moment to end a story but two she's not writing this on a deathbed she you know a lot of those life tales are at the end of the thing like I'm back home now from my shipwreck journey or I'm at my death store or this is I need to write my tale she's like 30 like she's she's not that old she's not maybe not done having children she's not mm-hmm. done living her life but something huge is about to happen. She thinks Sinjin is about to die. Does that cause her to then go back to the beginning and think about how she got there? Is it reminding us that this is a tale intentionally told? Yes, by Charlotte Bronte. But if we think of it as the story of Jane Eyre told by Jane Eyre, why is 34-year-old or 32-year-old, I think there's people that have worked out how old she would be, but why is 30-something Jane Eyre telling her story at this point you know we only hear about one child yeah that's a that's a you know i i, I love thinking about that now i had and i hadn't so thank you um it's why a really is... great... go ahead mary um, I was just, it's a really it's a really great point and it is interesting to ask why is she writing this now and i think think you know expecting a death or or be or or you know encountering a death or, or or knowing you know knowing that someone that you are close to or that you love is dying or, or will die soon or has died it does make you often reflect I think um and and often that is self-reflection on you and your life and here is Jane's story saying that this is my life um and this is why it's good um and and it's why I think you know the the end the endings are kind of it, it's it's two sides of the same coin because Jane is thinking, you know, oh, I made the right choices and this is why my life is good. But since you also right, made the right choices for him, although, you know, contemporary hat, we, we can disagree with that. But, you know, he, he, he made the right choices and, and that's good. And it also ends with hope, um, and which I think, again, reflects, mm-hmm. reflects her age and, and also the fact that she's not done living yet. Um, but, but that idea that when we are confronted with death, we want to think about the you know the after you know what happens after the afterlife or, or the potential and the idea that Sinjin will finally find joy in death and the afterlife and so will everybody else find joy in death and the afterlife and it's the same for all of the people that she has known along the way Helen her parents her uncle uh, but you know all of her uncles that they are happy in the afterlife um and and I think it's that yeah that's a great that's a really interesting point you know why is she writing this and maybe it's um and yeah that kind of Jane isn't done living yet but also death is not the end um I think it's a really interesting way to look at the ending 
of the, of, yeah, the text. Should we leave it there? <laughs> Death is not the end. We can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've got pretty late today. Um, mm. uh, thank you uh, all. Uh, in the audience for going on another Biblio venture with me and, and all the great co-hosts that, that we've had. Um, many of you have been along for Dracula and Frankenstein as well. So we've been together for almost two years now uh, talking about books. Um, with Jane Eyre, I didn't, I didn't completely know what to expect. This was a novel I loved, but I had never taken the methodical chapter by chapter deep dive into it. Um, I knew the book would hold up, but, you know, there's certainly enough, you know, scholarship out there to demonstrate its status as a great book. And I think we've seen the lasting appeal of it. Uh, truly great books are not just popular for a time, but are revisited by succeeding generations, still speak to readers long removed uh, from the circumstances of their creation. And Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre still has that resonance. Um, I love how so many of our guests on this show have talked about the differences between their first readings of Jane Eyre, usually as teenagers, and then their subsequent readings in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and, you know, 50s, um, uh, that books can speak to us over the decades of our lives, you know, in different voices to match our own evolving characters, um, that's like a, it's a marvel I, I will never tire of in, in, in books. Um, and uh, so thank you to Charlotte Bronte. Uh, thank you for this still brilliant story with characters who still live for me, yet have changed in my perception. Jane, Rochester, Adele, Bertha, Blanche, uh, Sinjin. Uh, yes, even thank you for Sinjin. Um, <laughs> And if it, even if it's just for that final scene when Jane hears Rochester's voice and tells Sinjin to get lost, um, I hope this Biblio venture was as valuable to you as it was to me. I hope you'll join, join us for our next reading adventure through Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And so Bronte, Soares, and Airheads, thank you for tuning in to this final episode of Sundays with Jane Eyre. If you missed any episodes, they're all available on the Rosenbach's YouTube channel, like our Dracula and Frankenstein shows. There's also a Facebook group for, uh, uh, well, or like that, it was the, the Facebook group for Jane Eyre will continue. And there's a new Facebook group for Austin Mondays. I hope you all join us for Austin Mondays beginning in September. Thanks to Brianna, who has been our chat, Mrs. Fairfax for most of the shows putting the links in the chat there. Thanks to all the staff at the Rosenbach um, who have helped behind the scenes. Uh, Rosa and uh, Elizabeth, our Fuller, our librarian, who's been in the chat almost every uh, week as well. That's been really great. And happy birthday, Emily, who's had her birthday today. Um, let me make one last request for you to support the Rosenbach by donation or by becoming a member. Your support helps us make these shows and will certainly help us with the next one. Uh, Mary and Lauren, thanks for the last two years. Um, <laughs> you've rotated through all of these shows, uh, and it's been really great to have you. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah, it's been really great, and um, I'm sad not to be joining you next time. Um, but if you ever come back to the Gothic, um, I'll be there, but I'm sure you'll all have a really wonderful time with, uh, with Austin and Pride and Prejudice. And Lauren will be another big adventure for you with us, right? Yeah, I'm really excited to be, to be coming back. I'm sad not to have my other half, but Mary and I have got some plans. Um, you know, now we're both, uh, I've not mysteriously ill and Mary's uh, almost at that final point of the PhD. We've got some, some ideas for, for new content and maybe we can, uh, maybe we can get Ed on one of our shows. And I'd be happy it. to. Yeah. <laughs> some of your ghoul guide shows, there'll be more ghoul guide content. I love that. Yeah. Uh, that would be really <laughs> fabulous. And thank you both for so many connections with young scholars who we had as co-hosts, you know, I mean, I, I managed to find these people through you. Um, and, uh, and that's been really great. Um, especially Kathleen Hudson, who is, who wound up being a regular co-host on this show. Uh, and I've really loved, um, uh, Janine, Janine Hatter, I think came through you guys, Hannah Moss came from you guys. Um, so that's been really nice. Um, and the other co-hosts we've had Christine Woody, Lucasta Miller, 
Um, we had uh, Christine Woody, Michael Stewart, uh, Fanula Austin, Deborah Lutz, Rowan Coleman, uh, and Sophie Franklin, Adele Hay, and Claire O'Callaghan, who will continue with us for a Bronte course through the Rosenbach uh, that I invite you all to join. Thanks to Tucker Christine for making such beautiful music. Thanks to my daughter, Sophie and Lulu. Uh, Sophie shot the footage for the credits and Lulu edited it. Um, I also had great conversations about the book with them uh, and their ideas I know have filtered their way into my own perception of this novel. Uh, thanks to my wife, Kate, without whom I would accomplish almost nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. And just like Jane, it's true. I know what it is to live entirely for and with what I love best on her. So, and I am so grateful for that. Playing us out for the credits will be Plea the Gazelle Secrets. Farewell, Mary and Lauren. I'll see you guys soon. Farewell, readers. May you live entirely for and with what you love best on earth. Bye-bye. <laughs>